Hello, everybody. Welcome back to Reason in Theology. We're doing a Q&A, Ask Us Anything, more so Dr. Jim, uh, on the Church Fathers with Dr. Jim Papandrea. Dr. Jim, great to see you. How are you? And welcome back to the show. I'm good. I'm good. Uh, everything's fine. How are you doing? Doing great. Yeah, I'm excited about this. I love the Church Fathers, and I can't wait to hear people's questions. So yeah, this is a live show, so go ahead and put your questions in the chat. Make sure to tag me by putting at reason and theology, and we'll do our best to get to it. Uh, let's start out with the first one that we see here. Uh, this is from Tater. I love the name, by the way. What is the strongest argument for the Catholic papacy and the Church Fathers, and what is the strongest against it? Well, you know, um, I, I guess the strongest argument is that there is an, uh, you know, an unbroken connection from Jesus through the apostles to the current bishops. And, you know, it's clear in the New Testament that Peter, for all his faults, still becomes the leader of the apostles. And um, there's no question about uh, the fact that historically, Peter is the first bishop of Rome, and the Pope is always the bishop of Rome. Now, you know, did the office of bishop or the office of the papacy look exactly like it does now? No, of mm -hmm. course not. But Peter was the first apostolic authority in Rome. He was, uh, so he's effectively the first bishop of Rome. He, he, he died in Rome. He was martyred there. His tomb is there. His tomb is still to this day directly under the main altar at St. Peter's Basilica in the Vatican. Um, and so, you know, the church has always kind of had this assumption that to be in the church is to be in communion with Rome and the Bishop of Rome. And, you know, you can see, you can track it through the church fathers, how they all sort of admit this, even the ones that are reluctant to admit it and wish they didn't have to admit it. They all admit that, well, you know, to be orthodox, to be on the, to be in the church and on the same page as you know the universal church, you have to be in communion with Rome. Mm -hmm. um, now, as far as like arguments against uh, papal authority and the papacy, um, I, I don't know of of any that are really all that convincing. Which is, I guess, why I'm Catholic. But um, but I mean, you know, just keep in mind that um, you, you know nobody is saying that you know, the Pope is perfect. Nobody is saying that every Pope has been a holy man because we've had some Popes who weren't holy men. Um, you know, I, I tell my students, that, you know, the, the just being Pope does not give him the power to, you know, guess the number of jelly beans in the jar and, you know, always get it right. I mean, that's not what papal infallibility is. So everything about the papacy um, is, is really about the office that, you know, whoever the current pope is, that's the office he fills, which is the bishop of Rome, uh, first among equals and head of the church. But, you know, it's it's sort of like, you know, the, the center of the church. And, you know, I mean, the, if you think about it, um, you know, I, I always say by, by rights, you know, Jerusalem should have been the head of the church. Theoretically, Jerusalem should have been the headquarters of the church. But it couldn't be because war was coming to Jerusalem. God knew that, right? And even though there was a there was a church in Jerusalem, James is the first bishop. Um, in fact, today's the feast of Saint James. Um, but but the headquarters of the church moves to Rome because Jerusalem was was sacked. The temple was destroyed. Eventually, all the Jews were kicked out of Jerusalem, and the city was destroyed and turned into a pagan city. So it just wasn't going to be the headquarters of the church. So if God had to move the headquarters of the church somewhere else, where else but the center of the empire from where the gospel could go out to the ends of the earth? And so uh, Peter goes to Rome. The headquarters of the church is moved to Rome. It's just a historic fact. It just is. Mm -hmm. Now, here's the one about ecumenical councils. What are prominent pieces of evidence to show that the early church held ecumenical councils to be infallible? And he has a second part. And are there statements from the fathers that show they believed their church to be an infallible organ? Right. Well, you know, the, the infallibility of the church is a kind of a dynamic process. And what I mean by that is, you know, um, they really did not convene an ecumenical council and say, 
welcome to this infallible ecumenical council, right? That, that's not how it happens. They have a council. And I mean, in one sense, what makes a council an ecumenical council, right? Because ecumenical means worldwide, the whole universal church. So what makes a council an ecumenical council as opposed to a regional council is everyone's invited. Every bishop from the whole world is invited. They don't all come, but the fact that they're invited means that whatever decisions are made in that council are binding on the whole church. But it's really only in retrospect that, you know, at, at, a, at a later council, council, for example, they will look back on the earlier one and say, you know, we ratify all the decisions at this council. And so um, the, the sort of proclamation of the decisions of a council as, you know, binding on the church is, um, you know, it, it is a part of churches, uh, our church's tradition, and it has a lot to do with consensus. But there are there are some things uh, like, you know, it sort of appears like the, the, you know, the Pope has a line item veto on, you know, some of the canons of some of these councils, because there are times when, in general, an ecumenical council is accepted for its decisions, but there are things in there that, you um, that are questionable and usually has to do with church politics between, you know, the, the power of the levels of power between the different metropolitans like Constantinople versus Alexandria and that kind of stuff. Um, but, um, but, but, you know, it, it, this, people have said this about Vatican II and mm -hmm. it's true of all the ecumenical councils. It takes a generation or two or three for everything to really settle in uh, to be ratified, to be sorted out, and, um, you know, for for the church to sort of uh, understand, you know, what the effect of the council is on the universal church. Yeah, very helpful. Here's, here's one about marriage. Did the church fathers mention a minimum age of marriage, or did they speak against child marriage? I've seen a quote of St. Ambrose floating around condemning child marriage, but I didn't find any source for it. Yeah, no, I haven't seen that. Now, you know, Ambrose would be on the cusp because, um, you know, in the fourth century is when Christianity becomes legalized. By the end of the fourth century, um, Christianity becomes the official religion of the Roman Empire. So that's when the church begins to have some real influence. Like if the church wanted to, you know, put some boundaries around the age at which a person can get married— that they wouldn't really have been able to do that until the late fourth century. Um, and, and in fact, that's really when our church's sort of ritual of, of, of marriage in terms of the ceremony uh, develops because, um, you know, before that time, you know, people either got married under Roman law or they didn't. And many of them didn't because they, they couldn't for, for various reasons. Um, but, be, you know, before the fourth century, people who got married, who were Christian, you know, they got married according to Roman custom and Roman law, and they got their bishop's blessing. And so, you know, the, sort of the standard in Roman culture would be um, a man gets married when he comes out of doing his military service, so about age 30. A, a, a woman or young girl often gets married at a much younger age, which is why, you know, you tend to have these these um, wider gaps than, than we're often used to. Um, so a man coming out of the military at 30 or 32 might marry a 16 year old. Um, you know, some people would get engaged uh, as early as 12, but they generally didn't, you know, actually consummate a marriage at that, at that early age. Um, so we're looking at like, you know, mid teens, um, as, as kind of the norm for girls and older for boys because of the military service. Yeah, here's one for you. So how many church fathers have written commentaries on the Psalms and which provide the richest commentary? Wow. Well, you know, um, the Psalms actually would be one of the books that, that you would find the most commentaries on. It seems like a lot of church fathers wrote commentaries on the Psalms. And the reason for this is that the Psalms was, uh, to a large extent, the prayer book of the early church. Um, early, in fact, I'm. This is my next book that's coming out. I'm working on a book on prayer uh, in the early church and how the church fathers prayed. Primary prayer in the early church is liturgy. It's the mass, right? Mm 
um, to the extent that there was any personal devotion at all in the early church, it really has to do with reading the Psalms as prayer and praying mm -hmm. the Psalms. And so you do get a lot of church fathers writing commentaries on the Psalms. I don't know if I can pick um, one that's better than the others. You know, they tend to um, they tend to be kind of all over the map with regard to historical versus metaphorical, allegorical interpretations. Um, and, uh, and, and, and honestly, um, you know, the, some of them can get kind of far fetched, you know? Yeah. Uh, so, you know, when, when you talk about like, like, I will say this, I'm not a fan of origin mm -hmm. and I know a lot of people are, but I think origin is just sort of way out there and, um, and way too influenced by the Gnostics. And so, you know, a lot of people will consider origin one of the greatest, um, you know, commentators on scripture, except that I personally don't find his commentaries all that helpful. So I would mm -hmm. go in other directions. But um, but, I, you know, I would say, look, if you're interested in the Psalms, read as, you know, as many different commentaries as you can get, you know, like like dip your toe into different authors and then see who you like. I like Jerome on the Psalms. He kind of gives a good balance between the literal and then the spiritual sense. So he, he kind of navigates that well in his commentary on the Psalms. But yeah, I get what you mean with origin. Like you read his commentary in Leviticus. It's just over the top allegorical. I and I love allegory, but he stretches it too much. He it's does. Like, oh, he does. Okay. Okay. You he need to, you need to put the brakes okay. on this. Thing. Yeah. <laughs> it's, it's, it's a little too much here to the point that he's denying the literal historical sense. So it's right. Like, right. And I mean, you know, this is origin is the guy who will say things like, you know, sometimes God puts, you know, outright mistakes in the Bible to give you a red flag to look for the deeper meaning. And I'm like, yeah, I don't want to go that far. Yeah, no, <laughs> I hear you. All right. So here's another one for you. Uh, what is your response to the idea that the writings of St. Ignatius of Antioch are obvious forgeries since they're too Catholic? <laughs> well, you know, this is, <laughs> I mean, clearly uh, the person who would make that argument um, is trying to discredit them because they sound so Catholic. I mean, look, there is a circular argument here, right? You you can either say that the things we consider to be Catholic developed early, and therefore the Catholic Church is the early church, or you would have to say, no, those things must have developed later, and therefore, you know, they're inserted later, or they're, you know, forgeries that are written later. But there's really no evidence for that. I mean, it's just sort of special pleading, like, well, it, it you know, it must be a later forgery because I, I just can't accept that it was written earlier. No, I, I think they were written when they were supposed to have been written in the first decade of the second century. Now, um, you know, there are versions. There's like three main different versions of the letters of Ignatius of Antioch. There's the short version, the medium version and the long version. Right. And the most authentic is probably the medium version, which is the, you know, the, the, the most um, reliable in terms of, you know, what Ignatius actually wrote. The short version probably comes from somebody summarizing it, and the long version comes from somebody embellishing on it. Um, but if anyone is interested in uh, the letters of Antioch, where's my book? Uh, this is this is a great translation. Uh, the Apostolic Fathers. It's got uh, letters of Antioch and a bunch of the other um, early Christian documents in it. Really good translations with um, you is know, that Lightfoot English, English and Greek on. Um, no, this is the Holmes one. It's it's more oh, recent. Okay, okay. Uh, but it's got English and Greek on facing pages. If you're interested in the Greek, so mm -hmm. um, I would I would go for that. But yeah, no, I I uh, I think you know. Ignatius of Antioch is a great source for us because it's it's there where we can see um, just, you know, how the church fathers believed in the real presence of Christ in the Eucharist. Uh, we can see the the office of bishop. We can see all of these things uh, in there. And uh, and no, it's not a forgery. It's legit. Yeah, for clarification, uh, Kyle is saying that Mike Gintron, uh, somebody who used to be Catholic, who's now just incredibly anti-Catholic, um, has stated that he refuses to read, read the early church fathers because he views them as early apostates. What's the counter to that argument that these were just all corrupt apostates? Well, I mean, okay, so, you know, 
our tradition, our church's tradition is built on the consensus of the church fathers. So, you know, with the caveat that, you know, sometimes you can find an outlier here and there, but in general, the church fathers are, you know, pretty unanimous on these things. Like, let's say the real presence of Christ in the Eucharist, unanimous. There is no argument about that in the early church. What happens on the altar is a miracle, etc. Okay. So the question is, if, if they're all apostates, who's not? Who do we have that's not, like, where would the tradition have been preserved that was somehow not apostate? Like, if the whole, if the whole consensus of the church fathers completely went off the rails and became something other than Christian, well, first of all, Jesus failed to keep his promise because Jesus promised that the gates of hell would not prevail against the church. And somehow, if, if the whole consensus of the church fathers went off the rails, then the church became something other than the church. But then the question would be, well, then how would anyone know what the tradition was supposed to be then? Where was the tradition preserved, right? And if you say in the Bible, right, never forget, there's one thing that's not in the Bible, the table of contents. In other words, there's no place in the Bible that tells you what books should be in the Bible. Like who picked the documents that went into the New Testament? The same church fathers who all believed in the real presence of Christ in the Eucharist and the office of bishop and all that stuff. So, when, you know, when somebody like, I don't know that person. And so, uh, you know, I, I don't know exactly where he's coming from or what his argument is. But when somebody like that says, I don't read the church fathers because, right, that's, you know, sticking your head in the sand, right? I don't study history because I know I'm not going to like what I find there. Well, I can't help you if that's your thing, you know. Appreciate that clarification there. Here's a really good one from City of the Immaculata. Who would you say the last early church fathers were, both East and West? Yeah, well, there's no hard and fast rule on this, and it depends who you ask. But yeah. I tend to go up to like Maximus the Confessor in the East, or perhaps John of Damascus, right? So so those would be the last ones um, in the East. And in the West, um, yeah, uh, good question. I mean, you know, I am a big fan of Ambrose. And so uh, I love, uh, but obviously Augustine comes after Ambrose. Augustine is Ambrose's disciple. Um, so there's Augustine, but there are some ways in which Augustine was kind of an outlier. And there are some teachings of Augustine that the church rejected, like the double predestination and that kind of stuff. The, the things that John Calvin reached back and, and, and pulled out, you know, he, he, he basically pulled out of Augustine exactly the parts of Augustine that the church rejected. Um, so, uh, so in some ways, you know, there's, there's, uh, I don't know. John Cassian maybe, um, but but when you get when you get a little bit later, I like uh, I also like um, Cyril of Alexandria, and you may say, oh well, he's an Easterner. Although in some ways, theologically, Christologically, Alexandria often leans more west than east. Sometimes, um, having said that, though, the dichotomy between east and west is way overplayed. So um, you know, the church is one. Uh, so, uh, yeah, that's, that's what I'll say about that right now. What about this one? Did the early church fathers practice intercession of the saints, even interceding to Mary? I want to be Catholic, but intercession to deceased saints is hard to accept because they may not hear me. Yeah. Well, the answer to the question is yes, they absolutely did. Uh, there is no time that anyone can point to when early Christians did not have a devotion to Mary and ask the saints for their intercession. In fact, if you go into the catacombs in Rome, into like some of the earliest places where the, where Christians celebrated their memorial meals, the 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 origin of the feasts of the saints, and um, you know, I'm thinking this, you know, third century at least, maybe second century, what you will find in the catacombs is graffiti scrawled in the walls from the early church, graffiti like Peter and Paul pray for me. Right. So people are going to the tombs of the saints and begging their intercession. Keep in mind, though, you know, nobody is saying that the saints are omniscient. Nobody is saying that the saints can hear you because they're so holy that they became, you know, divine and all of a sudden got this divine ability of hearing prayers. You know, th they can only hear the prayers because uh, of a gift from God 
because of, you know, who they are, the saints, um, and because of their, their proximity both to God in their spirits and in their relics, in their remains, their, their, you know, their physical bodies are still with us to the extent that they exist. And so there's, the, the, you know, this goes back to the church's doctrine of the resurrection. And um, yeah, I won't go into it now, but, but the, our whole doctrine of the resurrection of the body assumes an intimate and eternal connection between body and soul. Even mm -hmm. when our bodies and souls are separated, they're never completely separated. There's always this connection. So to be near the, the relics of the saints is to be close to the saints in their spirit who are in proximity with Christ in heaven. So that means you're somehow closer to Jesus and you can ask for the prayers of the saints. But to answer your question, yeah, the, the church, uh, Christians have always practiced this from the beginning. And and here's another interesting or, or I think important point. When, you know, when you look at some of these things that, that I think, you know, some people, maybe Protestants will claim were later additions. Not only do you have to ask, you know, when is the earliest time that we see this in the documents or in the archaeology? You know, when do we first see this? You also have to ask this question. When we first see it, do we see any controversy over it? Because if there's because if there's no controversy over it, it means it's not new when you see it. Because you know, early Christians were skeptical of anything new. So if someone were to introduce a new idea, like, hey, everybody, let's pray to the saints, if that was a new thing, there would have been a huge controversy over it, and they would have had to discuss it and figure out whether or not to do it. The fact that you don't see any controversy over it means that it's not even new the first time we see it in the evidence. It's, you know, and so there's really no time at all ever when you can point to when the church didn't have a devotion to Mary, didn't practice the intercession of the saints, etc. Very helpful. This is um, also an interesting one here. Let's see. Is there anything that the church fathers agreed on that the church does not hold to today? Like, I don't know, like. I think it mentions young earth or geocentrism or something like that. Is there a consensus among the fathers that the church doesn't accept? Wow. That's a really interesting uh, point uh, or question. I don't think so. I think that, um, well, you know, regarding the, you know, creation, creationism, et cetera. I mean, the, you know, the, the church fathers generally, um, you know, had this interesting balance where, you know, they, they believed, they certainly believed in the historicity of Genesis. So God really created the universe and there really was a Noah and there really was a flood and there really was an Adam. But on the other hand, it's not a science text. So don't look for creation to happen in six 24 hour days. You know, Augustine wrote a whole book on that. Um, so, so those things were not generally taken literally uh, in that sense. I, you know, I can't think of anything right now where there was a consensus among the church fathers that that we have since rejected. The only thing that pops into my head is there were a few of the church fathers. And by the way, these tend to be the rigorists that we talked about in our other conversation, mm -hmm. you know, um, Tertullian, Hippolytus, uh, Irenaeus. They they did sort of have a kind of dispensational, um, if, if eh, that's probably not the right word, but, uh, but a, a certain view of history where the six days of creation uh, represented 6,000 years, you know, based on the idea that, you know, a thousand years is like a day to God from the Psalms quoted in Peter. And so, you know, guys like Irenaeus and Tertullian would say, well, the six days of creation are telling us that there's going to be 6,000 years of human history before the return of Jesus and the seventh thousand years, the millennium, the millennial Sabbath or something. So they, they did kind of think uh, that the earth was, you know, roughly 4,000 years old. And so by that math, they sort of figured that Jesus was coming back around the year 2000. Um, but again, this, this was not a consensus among the church fathers, uh, although it was a kind of influential theory among some of them. But yeah. Did the early church fathers unanimously condemn dancing? And does that still apply to today? Wow, that's a great question. You know, I cannot think of any place in the Church Fathers where anyone mentions dancing. It was not, it, it, it didn't, doesn't seem to have been on their radar. Um, now, 
they did condemn certain aspects of Roman culture that they believed led to immorality. So where banqueting would include the performance of, let's say, the Roman world's version of exotic dancers, you know, they didn't have patience for that. Um, but the idea of social dancing, boy, I don't, I don't see that anywhere in the church fathers. Um, and I, I don't, uh, you know, you know, this is an interesting point because I've never really done my own research on, you know, whether Roman culture even had social dancing or what that would have looked like. Um, they certainly had, you know, social running around and getting drunk, you know, at their, <laughs> during their big holidays. Um, but, uh, I don't know about dancing, but the church fathers really don't, don't mention it. They don't talk about it. It's not, a, it, you know, I can't even think of anything in Clement of Alexandria. If anyone was going to talk about it and condemn it, it would have been him because he hates everything you like. Um, but, uh, <laughs> but I don't even remember it there. Um, yeah. What's the earliest, um, affirmation or assertion of the Holy Spirit's divinity in the early church fathers? Right. Well, okay. So we don't get a, a very developed pneumatology, uh, until maybe the fourth century when, you know, they, after they've sort of sorted out, you know, uh, Christology, they get around to the third person of the Trinity and say, okay, we better, we better say more about the Holy Spirit than what we've been saying before. But in terms of the, let's say, divine personhood of the Holy Spirit, that is assumed, uh, you know, from the earliest, the earliest Christian documents that mention the Holy Spirit. So, for example, the ones that are popping into my head would be the apologists of the second century, guys like Justin Martyr. And they will talk about the divinity. And even though they didn't yet have the Latin word trinitas, our word trinity, they talked about uh, God in Greek as a divine triad, Greek word triados. So, um, so God is the divine triad, and within the divine triad, they somebody like Justin Martyr will say something like, you know, the Father takes the first place, the Son takes the second place, and the Holy Spirit takes the third place. And then they talk about, you know, what do we know about the Holy Spirit from Scripture? Um, but it's clear that. The Holy Spirit is not for them a created being or an angel. Or now, you know, there were heretics back in the day who thought that. You know, the adoptionists and others thought the Holy Spirit was, you know, a, an archangel, a seraph, a created spiritual being. But the mainstream church did not think that. The mainstream church associated the Holy Spirit within sort of the divine Godhead, the, the divine triad. Um, but they very quickly would get to the point where they say, well, that's about all we can say about the Holy Spirit. We don't really know much more. It's a mystery. Uh, so, yeah. And then in the fourth century, after the Council of Nicaea and before the Council of Constantinople in 381, where they, where they, they added the, the, you know, the, that, the, the fleshed out third paragraph about the Holy Spirit, that fourth century, that's where they really got down to, um, sorting out new mythology because they had to because there were people denying the divinity of the holy spirit and so they had to they had to clarify that uh, this person's asking where should they start with church fathers any particular resources you could point them to right well i mean uh, you know it depends what you like and so um you know, I we all have our, our our different tastes. One approach would be to go chronologically, right? To start with the earliest ones and track through the history. So, so you might start by reading Clement of Rome, one of the early bishops of Rome. He wrote a letter that we generally call First Clement, but it's not super exciting, and there are things we wish we knew that he doesn't bother to tell us, and so it's kind of long. Um, uh, you, there, there's another document called the Didache which is our earliest sort of church order manual, how to do a baptism, how, you know, Eucharistic prayers. That's also from the first century. So those two documents overlap with the New Testament and were written before the end of the first century. Some scholars will date the Didache a little later, but I date it early. And then, but then there's the letters of Ignatius of Antioch. We talked about that earlier, very early in the second century. And these are fascinating because he's been arrested and he's on his way to Rome to be martyred and he's writing his last letters um, 
and uh, he's encouraging churches along the way. And so those those letters are are really fascinating. Um, in fact, in general, if if you get this book, right, this has all of the earliest Christian documents that are not in the New Testament. Some of them in here are a little fringy. There's a thing called the Shepherd, which is a little fringy. You know, like it's not super mainstream, but you know, you can mm -hmm. read it. And then, um, but then if you want like like uh, you know some really beautiful stuff from the Church Fathers in terms of deep theology. I love Ambrose of Milan, his On the Mysteries, where he gets into the sacraments. I love Clement, uh, sorry, not Clement, uh, Cyril of Alexandria um, on, on the unity of Christ, where he gets into Christology and the two natures of Christ. It's some deep stuff, but it's but it's really beautiful. Um, but also, I would also recommend, and you know, not to just like pitch my own books here, but I would recommend that you, you know, if you're really interested in getting into the Church Fathers, get some sort of overview of, of the Church Fathers that will help you know who's who and who wrote what and when they come in the time stream. So, you know, my book, Reading the Church Fathers, my uh, 2022 book, is, is pretty comprehensive for that. But, I mean, also anything by Mike Aquilina is great. Anything by um, uh, Marcellino D'Ambrosio can't go wrong. Um, and then, you know, if people want to go deeper, deeper, I could recommend some of my colleagues in, you know, who are scholars, um, who have written some really deep stuff too. But, um, but yeah, that's, that's where I would start. Yeah. Okay. Um, so can you give us some names of early church fathers who believed in the real presence of Christ in the Eucharist? Um, well, they all did. I mean, literally, they all did. But if you read it, if you read the letters of Ignatius of Antioch, you'll see it there. Um, if you read, um, if you read Ambrose, Augustine. Um, now, Augustine's tricky because depending on how his Latin is translated into English, he goes he goes into this stuff where he's using he's using words like sign and symbol, and if if you're not careful, it can sound like He's talking out of both sides of his mouth. So Augustine is maybe a little bit more for, um, yeah, you know, advanced. But uh, let's see, who else would I recommend? Um, yeah, I, I'm I'm blanking on some on some others to be specific, but they they there is really no argument over this um, at all until the ninth century, and even in the ninth century, when there's a controversy over. The, the, the real presence of Christ in the Eucharist, it's not really a question about whether or not Christ is really present. It's a question mm -hmm. over the philosophical definition of the word real. In mm -hmm. other words, like, you know, what's more real, the things you can touch or the things you can't touch. And so, um, so, so it becomes a philosophical argument. Uh, I have a chapter on this specifically in my book, Handed Down from Catholic Answers Press. And and in that chapter, I track through the entire history of the early church through into the Middle Ages, you know, and and all the way through. And you can see not only, you know, with excerpts from the church fathers, where it's very clear that they all believe in the real presence of Christ in the Eucharist. And I track it all the way through to, to the, you know, coining the term transubstantiation and how even though it took them a thousand years to get that word the word does describe what the church has always believed. Yvonne asks, did the early church fathers say that women shouldn't teach in the church? And if so, what exactly did that refer to preaching only or catechesis also? Right. Well, um, the church fathers generally, um, thought they, they, they generally believed that they were following the advice of St. Paul in the new Testament uh, which is to say that uh, women can teach other women and children, um, but men teach men, and generally the, the sexes are, are kept separate a lot, um, even for catechesis, although it's not always clear whether that, was, whether that was consistent. But the issue here is not really about teaching. Um, the issue is about authority over teaching, and authority over presiding. So, so with regard to teaching, um, the person with the authority over what is being taught in any given place is the bishop. 
because the bishop is in that succession from the apostles. And so the bishop in any given place has the authority over what's being taught. And either the bishop is doing the teaching or the bishop is delegating the teaching to specific priests or lay catechists. And there are some lay catechists, but they're men. Um, they generally did not delegate that task to women. Um, and, it, you know, it, it has to do with sort of uh, safeguarding the teaching and faithfully handing it down from one generation to the next. And um, so, uh, so so it has to do that. So the, the bishops had the authority over really at least three things, the teaching, the discipline of the church, um, which includes the, the ability to excommunicate and stuff, and, and then presiding. And, um, and, you know, presiding over the sacraments was always also a, a male only thing. I mean, the, the priests in the early church were, uh, were men and there's no evidence that, you know, there were ever any, uh, women presiders. We can talk more about this if that, if that is, uh, of interest to people, but, you know, you will hear some people, even scholars sometimes saying that there were, that there were female priests in the early church, female presiders. That's absolutely not true. And anyone who says that is, is, confusing the idea of a host of a house church with the presider of the house church. So there were hosts of house churches who were women because they had the resources to supply a worship space. So you read about Lydia or Claudia or, you know, uh, and they, you, you know, you get these greetings in the new Testament, you know, greet the people who meet in so-and-so's house. That does not mean that person is the presider. Um, where the host is a is a man, he may have been the presider, but generally the presider over the sacraments is someone different than the host who who um, provides the space. Lesman asks, were the early church fathers Eastern Orthodox or Catholics? Yes, <laughs> they were both, and um, and the the word the words Orthodox and Catholic both mean exactly the same thing until they don't. In other words, what I mean by that is this. In the early church, and really up through the 11th century, Orthodox and Catholic mean the same thing. Now, you know, Catholic, we say it means the universal church, right? But the point of that is to say that something is the Catholic church is to set boundaries around the true church versus whatever is outside of that that is not the true church. Orthodox means, you know, correct, correct doctrine, right? But again, it means the same thing. It means to put boundaries around what is true as opposed to what is false that is outside the boundaries. So for the first thousand years of the church's existence, the church as a universal church was both Catholic and Orthodox. But then in the 11th century, in the well, you know, the, 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 the break date we put on there is 1054, um, when the, when the East and West split, then it became a kind of, you know, war of words where the Westerners are saying, we're Catholic and you're not, we're the universal church and you're not, you're outside of it. And the Orthodox were saying, we're, we're Orthodox and you're not, we're correct and you're, you're false. And it, it and so the, these words, Catholic and Orthodox took on the meaning that we tend to think of them having today. Um, but the early church was, was both. It really was. Yeah. Yeah. Here's another one. Um, what would you say about Pope Honorius? Was he infallible? Well, okay, so Pope Honorius is the, you know, sort of the, the famous um, one, the, the one Pope that people point to if they want to say, aha, heresy at Rome. And, um, you know, on one level, he's the exception that proves the rule, but he, he, he wasn't really a heretic. Um, now, was he infallible? Well, any pope is only infallible because of the infallibility of the office, right? Any, any, anyone who holds the office of pope is only infallible because Jesus has promised to protect the church from completely going off the rails, right? And so even when we did have bad popes, they, they, never, they never took the church off the rails doctrinally. Um, I mean, they were too busy with their own sins to do that, I guess. Pope Honorius is a sad story about a, about a guy who, let's say, wasn't the smartest pope we've ever had, but only wanted unity. And in the name of unity, he agreed to some things he shouldn't have, 
because he didn't really think them through or he didn't really understand them. But he thought by agreeing to some some, you know, proposed doctrines that he would that he would maybe facilitate unity between East and West. And at the end of the day, um, it backfired on him because then he was accused of heresy and died before he could defend himself. So I would say he does not count as um, as an example of a heretic at Rome. And in fact, I would argue that Rome is the, the only metropolitan that's never been embarrassed by heresy. There's been heresy in every other major, major patri patriarchate, not Rome. So. Here's a fun one. Why did the early church fathers use the King James Version of the Bible? Okay, now that uh, the person must be uh, being a little tongue in cheek there. I think so. <laughs> the King James Version of the Bible uh, is uh, was commissioned, uh, as the name says, by by King James, who was actually both King of England and Scotland at the time, I believe. But th this is this is 1611, so this is way too recent for my expertise. You you know, you're talking about the King James Bible. You're doing current events. I don't do current events. Um, but uh, the you know the it, it brings up an important point because it used to be that you could open any English Bible and yeah you know you're going to get something pretty reliable. But those days are gone. Um, there are a lot of bad English translations of the Bible out there, um, and uh, I have I have videos I've done on this. But um, but but everyone should be aware, you know that. When you read the Bible in English, you're reading a translation and you're depending on the translators not to spin it too much in their direction. And there are anti-Catholic translations, right? Mm -hmm. um, those translations that, that render, I think it's, um, is it Matthew 6, 7, where Jesus says, you know, don't babble on and on like the pagans. There are translations that include the phrase, um, you know, they, they think they will be heard for their vain repetition. That phrase, vain repetition, is not in the Greek. The word repetition is nowhere in the text. But but some Protestant translators twisted or tweaked that translation to try and rule out the rosary, right? Repetitive prayers are bad. No, they're not. In fact, Jesus himself prayed the same thing over and over again. It tells us that in the Gospels. When he prayed in the Garden of Gethsemane, it says he prayed the same prayer several times. So anyway... Um, so when we, and especially when we read the words of Jesus in the gospels, right, those may, may have been translated twice from Aramaic into Greek and then Greek into English. Now, don't, don't get me wrong. I'm not saying we've lost anything in translation. I'm just saying you need to get a good translation. And so, um, yeah, we can talk more about that, but, um, but it, but it matters. It definitely matters. Are there any church mothers? Yes. Yes, there are. Um, and uh, so there are several church mothers. Now, um, some of them are, you know, pretty famous, well-known saints of the church. St. Monica, the mother of St. Augustine. St. Helen, the mother of the Emperor Constantine. Um, St. Macrina, the older sister of the famous um, Cappadocian bishops, Basil and Gregory. She was their teacher. They learned theology from, from their sister. The thing about that, though, is that most of these church mothers, um, uh, yeah, I see that, yeah, Mo most of these church mothers, you know, we only know about them because, because the men in their lives wrote about them, right? But there are a couple of church mothers where we do have something that they wrote and you can read them in their own words. So anyone who's interested in the mothers of the church, should should look for the diary of Saint Perpetua. This is a this is a young woman in Carthage, who was uh, condemned to die in the arena as a martyr, along with the rest of her catechism class, for being a Christian. And she kept a diary while she was in prison. You can read it; it's, it's out there. It's on the internet in English. There's also a, a little bit more obscure sort of diary or uh, collection of letters from a woman named Egeria who went on a pilgrimage to the Holy Land in the 4th century and uh, wrote about it. So there are a couple of church mothers who, uh, you know, we can actually read them in their own words. 
Um, this is an interesting one, although I misplaced it. Here it is. What uh, church fathers wrote about indulgences? Mm, indulgences. <laughs> yeah. Well, you know, an indulgence is is sort of a matter of church discipline. Um, and I'm trying to I, I, I'm trying to think how early we actually get the word indulgence. Um and I, I can't pinpoint where the concept of an indulgence comes up first, but let me say this: the an indulgence is is not what most people think it is. And uh, Michael, I'm sure you you know you could actually probably do a better job of explaining this uh, than I could. But an indulgence is kind of a um, uh, the the church's acknowledgement that penance was done in some way, shape, or form. And so let me say this. The church fathers all did believe in penance. They all did believe in purgatory, although they uh, they don't all describe purgatory um, in as much depth as we might wish they would, but they all believed that there was some sort of purification necessary after death. And, and they all had this understanding that you know, when we do penance in this life, that contributes to our purification. And so there is a ver very real sense in which you, you're going to do the penance, you're, you're going to get the purification now or later. More penance now means less purification later. And so penance now takes the form of prayer, fasting, almsgiving, uh, etc., right? And so these are things that we do now that are penances. And so just to give you an example, like all the way back, you know, from the second century, for sure, um, you know, we can see it in Clement of Alexandria. We can see it in, you know, I mean, I, 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 there are fewer that, that we won't see it in, but we can see it in all these church fathers all the way through where they talk about how almsgiving is a penance, you know, which, which shows us that they believe in penance they believe that penance is of benefit for us, um, and they believe that that almsgiving is a penance along with prayer and fasting. And so, um, so there is this sense that you know you're you're, you're either going to do the purifications now or you're going to do them later. And um, of course, this is all based on you know what what Saint Paul says in First Corinthians, how um, you know a, a a person does good works and bad works in this life. The good works will go to heaven with them. The bad works will be burned up as though through fire. And so this is the sort of biblical basis for, for the doctrine of purgatory, which is that, you know, no matter how literally you want to take the image of fire there, we will all have to be purified of whatever impurities we, you know, we can't carry with us into the afterlife. And so, um, so, so an indulgence is sort of just the church's, I don't know, recognition that um, that that penance is done, and it's a way for the church to offer penance and say, okay, look, if you if you go on a pilgrimage, let's say that counts as a penance, but it's not a get out of hell free card. It's not you know time off of hell or anything like. That. There's all kinds of misconceptions about that. So anyone who, who's interested in penance in, in well in indulgences, but also penance and purgatory, you know, I would encourage you to read up on that. What the church actually teaches. So did the church fathers unanimous, unanimously believe that only a minority of people will be saved in the end? Uh, that's a good question. I, I don't think there, there's any consensus on this. I, um, I mean, if I had to speculate, um, if I had to s sort of, you know, speculate, if you were to ask the church fathers that question, they would probably mostly say that there will be more people in hell than in heaven. Um, so, so, I mean, in that sense, yeah, they probably did assume that. Um, but there's no uh, sort of doctrine about that with, you know, with, with any great, you know, documented consensus or anything that I know of. How did church fathers contribute to identifying sacred tradition? Well, you know, they, they contributed to it by writing it down. And um, it's a, you know, it's a kind of a dynamic process. In fact, you know, if if humans had control over this, we would want it to be much more concrete and controlled and, you know, and because we're afraid it's somehow fragile or something like that. But it really is a kind of a dynamic process, which is, you know, the teachings of Jesus and the apostles are handed down 
over time from one generation to the next. But in every generation, there are challenges to those teachings. There are, you know, there are people who who go to the extremes, right? And those those alternatives have to be confronted. And so the church fathers, in confronting these, you know, we'll call them heresies, right? These these extreme alternatives, the church fathers in every generation clarify the the tradition just a little bit more. And so so not only is the tradition being preserved and handed down, but it's sort of it's developing at the same time. So so it's being created over time as well. And um, you know I talk about this a lot in my books, but you know the orthodoxy, the church's tradition is always this sort of place of balance between the extremes. And so you know you've got this pendulum effect where somebody goes to one extreme over here and the church has to correct. But there's always going to be someone who will, overcorrect and go to the other extreme. And again, yeah. the church has to correct. And so the history of the church is very much this sort of history of, of, you know, always interpreting scripture, but also always finding that place of balance down the middle between the extremes. Yeah, that's very helpful. And, um, you know, we're, we're wrapping it up here. We're almost close to the hour mark. Tell us a little bit about your book on the church fathers. I know we had a video doing it, but for those who have not yet seen that video, tell us a little bit about it. Yeah, so it's uh, it's called Reading the Church Fathers, uh, History of the Early Church and the Development of Doctrine. And it really goes through the whole overview of the early church, introducing you to the major players, all the church fathers and mothers, and their major documents. And then, of course, you know you can go read them, um, but it gives you the timeline and, and how the doctrines developed and what is orthodoxy and what is heresy and just sort of gives you that, that broad overview. It also has a chapter on the, um, you know, how we got our Bible and the Christian, mm. the Christian canon. And then, uh, so that, that book was published in 20, 2022 as a, um, uh, as a revision of an earlier book. Don't get the earlier book, get the, get the more recent one. And, uh, and, but then I took that chapter on the Bible and I turned that into a book uh, that came out more recently. So my latest book is, um, you know, reading scripture like the early church, seven insights from the church fathers to help you understand the Bible. And um, so that really goes into more depth, how the church fathers, those closest in time to Jesus and the apostles, how they interpreted scripture. So, yeah. I put a link to the video that we did on the uh, on the book. It's called Understanding the Church Fathers with Dr. Jim. I put that again in the show notes. So y'all certainly go and watch it. It was very, very comprehensive as far as an overall uh, presentation of the church fathers. So if you're not really familiar with them and you want to get your feet wet, definitely start there and then go and get the book. Thank you so much, Dr. Jim, for coming on and doing this. Any parting words, any concluding thoughts, any plugs that you want to put in? No, I mean, I just, I appreciate it. I hope we can do it again soon. Um, you know, I, you, you know, I'm, I'm going to Rome, uh, for, uh, for a while. So yeah. we'll uh, maybe co correspond while I'm there. Maybe we'll do some stuff. Um, but in the meantime, if folks want to just, uh, uh, subscribe to my YouTube channel too. So, uh, so you can watch my videos as well. So. And tell us the name of the channel. Oh, it's the original church. So it's under my name. Um, I think it's YouTube slash the original church, but uh, yeah, look for the original church. I'll put a link to that also in the show notes. So yeah. Um, and I'm looking forward to your visit in Rome, by the way. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> uh, I, I definitely hope that we could do something while you're there. You bet. Everybody smash that like button and the subscribe button and go subscribe to Dr. Jim's channel and certainly check out his book on the early church fathers. Thank you all so much for your participation in this live stream. This was excellent. And also check me out patreon.com forward slash reason and theology. If you like what you see here and you want to get access to extra content and support what we're doing. All right, that's going to do it. We'll see you later. All right. Thanks, thanks a lot. for watching. Don't forget to hit the like button and the subscribe button. See you.